welcome uh, church family that's here and church family abroad. Um, I know it's early, and the scripture I found this morning was kind of funny. It said, a loud greeting in the morning is, brings a curse to his neighbors. So I don't want to do that this morning, but um, we, we are a little bit early, but thank goodness God's mercies are new every morning. And early in the morning, I will lift my praise to you. So we're in good stead with the word. So I just want to read a little bit. Behold, I will create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Be glad and rejoice forever. And that's what we want to do this morning is just rejoice in the Lord and his mercy. And we just going to do that, hopefully. So join us. shame not get past my blame till he called my name i'm so glad he changed me darkness held me down jesus pulled me out i'm no longer bound i'm so glad he saved me see i'm now a new creation in christ the old has gone this life i live by faith not by sight Jesus opened my eyes, now I see the light, I'm so glad he changed me. Now I'm walking free, I've got the victory, it's all over me, I'm so glad he changed me. See, I'm now a new creation in Christ, the old has gone this life, I live by faith, not by sight. Of my story, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. We have a lot to be excited about. How many of you are tired? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. That's what I tell myself. Dave, quit being tired. Because I have life in me. That life is from Jesus. We're going to testify right now. This is a story by uh, Big Daddy Weave. Or this is a song by Big Daddy Weave called My Story. If I told you my story, would you hope that wouldn't let go? And 
It's great to have a story, isn't it? The story of what Jesus has done for us. And I, some of you today need a story. I think maybe we all need a new story. Some of you may be coming in and it just seems like uh, there's this problem or this situation or a friend that such a weight on us. Maybe it's something that's a problem for us or maybe it's just uh, a problem that we're aware of. And what I find about coming to the altar, coming to the altar is where I can find out that that was not a weight that was intended to be mine in the first place. God wants to carry that. He wants to help me. He wants to come alongside me. He says, uh, with him, the burdens are light. And so if you've got a heavy burden this morning, you need to trade that in for the one that Jesus wants to give you. And a good way to do that is to come up to the altar. You can do it at your seat. You can do it around your kitchen table. Um, But a lot of us find that as we come to the altar and we have friends pray for us, that that burden becomes not the heavy burden, uh, but the light burden of walking together with Christ. So let's go ahead and sing our next song. And if you want to come down to the altar and pray, you're more than welcome to. You're still enough to keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. You move, you move the mountains, and 
Our faithful God is here to refine us like gold. Everyone wants to be gold, but we don't always want to go through the fire. But the fire is okay because the Lord will be there with us. Just as the, the three Israelites were in the furnace and they saw the people outside saw a fourth person walking around, that was Jesus. That was the Lord. He is with us through as he takes us through the purification process. Jesus is there. The Lord, our prayer to you right now is that you purify us and that you give us the strength to go through the fire. Because your end result is that we will be precious jewels, precious metal, purity before you. So purify us now. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold. Precious silver, purify my heart. Let me be as gold, pure gold, refiner's fire. My heart's one desire is to be. I choose to be, to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. If as we were singing that, you felt an urge to come to the altar, you can come anytime. So if you want to come forward right now as we sing again, feel free to do that. Those of you that are at home, if the Lord is moving on you, feel free to kneel at your chair or to remain seated in your on your couch and just bow your head and bow your heart. The Lord looks upon the inward man. If you are praying from the inside of your soul, Lord, purify me. The Lord will do that for you. Let's sing. Oh, purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver, purify my heart, let me be as gold, pure. Let's sing verse 2. Purify my heart. Lord, cleanse me from within and make me holy. Cleanse me from my sin deep within. Purify my heart. Cleanse me from within and make me holy. Purify me from my
choose to be, to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Let me be ready, ready to do your will. Make me ready to do your will. Good morning. Be patient while I readjust. <laughs> Is that good? You can hear me? Good to be with you, church family. And um, I wish I could see those of you at home, but welcome also. I'm looking forward to the time when we can all meet together again. Um, I think that's coming. How many have had their vaccine? Maybe, is that politically correct to ask that? I, I, how many have had their vaccine? Okay, those are the people you want to sit by next week. Okay. Um, a little bit ago, Mark approached me and said, I have a theme for... Um, the next series of sermons. And he said, I want to look at the people touched by Jesus. How cool is that? I got really excited, and I immediately thought um, about the women in the New Testament that Jesus had a one-on-one -on -one with. And there is a number of them. And, and the reason that is so special is because these women lived in a culture they lived in a society that did not really value women that much. They were just kind of something to be bought and sold, something to be used. Um, and Jesus encountered a number of women in an up-close and personal way. So that's, that's what I decided to name uh, the sermon as we kick off this, this series of uh, Touched by Jesus. My sermon is up-close and personal. Now, when you think of these women in the New Testament, um, what are some of the women you think of? New Testament. But Ruth is a good one in the Old Testament. <laughs> woman at the well. Did I hear that? I kind of heard a woman at the well. But that's okay. I got the idea. What are some other, other women you automatically think of when you think about somebody that Jesus personally touched? Mary Magdalene? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What are some others? Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. That was really awesome, wasn't it? His mom. Yeah, there is a number of them. There is a number of them. Um, I picked two uh, to talk about today, and the first one I picked was the Canaanite woman who was really aggressive in getting to see Jesus, and then they had this somewhat odd conversation, um, and it's hard to explain why Jesus would talk to a woman this way, and it appears that he calls her a dog. So do you know the encounter I'm, I'm talking about, the Canaanite woman? So we're going to talk about that first and unpack it a little bit, and... Um, she was also called the Syrophoenician woman in Mark, but we know, know her as a Gentile woman that was really aggressive in wanting to get to see Jesus. You can find this in Matthew 15, if you've brought your Bibles, Matthew chapter 15, and I will start reading at verse 21. Leaving that place... Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon, Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So the disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. 
he replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their little dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that very hour. So what's really happening here? What's really happening here? Jesus leaves and goes to Tyre and Sidon. And that is out of the Jewish territory. So he's now in pagan land. Okay? And then this Canaanite woman, this woman starts stalking him. The woman knows she's the son of David, and he knows he can heal her, but Jesus ignores her. The disciples are bothered by this stalker. He wants her to go away. Then Jesus speaks, reminding those, I came to the Israelites. This seems to prompt the woman into action. She becomes more determined. She gets up close and personal. Jesus speaks to her in a conversation. Jesus recognizes her faith, and her daughter is healed. This is what happened. Seems like a good story, I would think. But you know, there's some things in this that I really have problems with. First, he reminds those listening that he came for the lost sheep of Israel. And then he appears to call her a dog. It's like, really, Jesus? If this is Jesus up close and personal, I am not sure I want to go there. So we're going to look at this a little closer. We're going to ask ourselves, what is really happening here? So let's first look at, I came to the lost sheep of Israel. Who are the lost sheep of Israel? It would be the Jewish people who are no longer, or maybe never did, follow their shepherd. These are the lost sheep of Israel. All humanity, all humanity has been infected with sin. God has a plan, and that plan was to redeem all mankind. This was God's plan. Now, I put this plan into part A and part B, because I thought that would be the easiest way for me to explain it. It's not two separate plans. It's one plan, part A and part B. In part A, God chose the nation of Israel to be his people. God revealed himself to the Israel nation and invited them into a covenant. In the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament, he reminds them of this covenant. I will be your God, you will be my people. That was Israel. Through them, through Israel, the Messiah was to come offering salvation and blessings to everyone. Okay? And then part B of this plan was that Israel was to be the light of the world. And because of this light, the nations would come into a knowledge and blessings of God. They would come into relationship with God. They would see the nation Israel and go, that's the nation that has one God, worships one God, and is waiting for the Messiah. I want to be there. So that was plan B. So when he said, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, he was telling her, or she was at least hearing her say, I am the Messiah, I am the Savior, I am the healer of all nations. He was talking about his ministry to the Jewish nation. He was still working on part A. He was training his disciples, hoping that they would do part B. One of the last things, in fact, he tells his disciples before he ascends to heaven is, go and make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's the Great Commission. That's found in Matthew 28. So this did not discourage her, did it? In fact, it seems to kind of make her more aggressive. She propels herself into action. She worships him. She gets more in his face, I believe. 
She realizes he is, in fact, the Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for. And she says, let's look at this conversation. She says, Lord, help me. He answers, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Did you cringe when you hear that? Does it make you kind of feel like, oh, this, this needs a little bit more explanation? And she says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So let's examine this a little bit more. It's not me, it's you. Okay. I just want to make sure that blame goes where it's supposed to go. So this is good filler. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me? I think I'll maybe do it if I... Ooh, it doesn't take away that horrible sound. See, I was looking out there and you were all going, and I just thought it was me. <laughs> oh my, what's that? why are they cringing at me? How's that? So should I start over? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you heard what I was saying, didn't you? Okay. So where are we? Okay, we're going to look at what exactly is happening in this conversation. Um, the children represent God's chosen people, Israel. We've already talked about that. The bread in this conversation is Jesus because he's the bread of life. And the little dogs are the Gentiles, the unclean, the non-Jewish people, okay? Now, there's something that you need to note here. This is very important any time you read any of Jesus' words in the New Testament. Jesus spoke in Aramaic. These are written down in Greek. When they were written down, about 50 to 100 A.D., I think that's when most of the New Testament was written, 50 to 180. I was looking at the professor here. Is that right? <laughs> um, Greek was the language of scholars. So this is written in Greek. Jesus spoke in Aramaic. So to really know what he's, you know, what, what's going on here, I looked at the two Greek words. The Greek word for dog is K-U-O-N, and it's used by Jews to say unclean spiritual derogatory terms. It was not good to be called this word. And the Jews used it a lot. The disciples probably used it. So this Canaanite woman that was talking to Jesus had probably been called this before. But the word that is used here that they got from the Aramaic, what Jesus said and translated and put down in Greek, is actually a different word. And it's K-U-N-A-R-I-O-N. I'm not even going to try to say it. I don't speak Greek. And it actually means little dog. This is an affectionate word, like you're talking about the family pet or something. It can be used derogatory also, but very rarely is. It's more an affectionate word. So I think what he's saying here is um, his duty was to the people of Israel. Taking his attention from this call would be seen as violation of his mission. Or, like a father taking food from his children in order to throw it to the family pet. This, this situation is what they were dialoguing about. He was not being cruel, but he was reminding her of his mission. He was reminding the disciples, because he was speaking to the disciples here. He was being a model to the disciples here. He was reminding the disciples of his ministry and their ministry because they had not been called yet to minister to the Gentiles. They were at this time called to the Jews. So he was not insulting her. 
He was just reminding her his first priority was to the Jewish people. Jesus did not have disdain for the Gentiles. He had already made himself known to the Gentiles. I mean, he's in pagan country, and they know who he is, and this woman is coming to ask for his healing. So the Gentiles were very aware of this prophet, this Messiah, this Jesus person that was doing great things. Chapter 8 of Matthew, chapter 8 of the same um, gospel, uh, a centurion, a Roman centurion actually comes to him, and he heals his servant. So he had already done healing among the Gentiles. There wasn't, he loved the Gentile people. He loved everyone, and he loved the Gentile people. So I believe that he was doing a little play on words here, and he was gently reminding her where she was to him. But he also was asking her, who do you think I am? And she answered by saying, heal my daughter. You are, you are Jesus. There's only so many people he could reach and teach during his ministry, and he was asking the chosen people to be his light. His hope was not that the apostles would be getting ready for part B of his plan. So when she said, yes, Lord, and even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table, and you'll have some Bibles will say little dogs, some Bibles will say their dogs, some Bibles will say dogs, and some Bibles will actually say their pets there. So I went to different translations. But it, uh, it is an affectionate term, but it is also a play on words because I think he knew that she'd been referred to like the other Gentiles as a dog. And she says, I know who you are. You can heal my daughter. I will take that any way I can. She's being a mom, fighting for her daughter who's demon-possessed, and she doesn't care what her order in the plan is. She wants healing, and she wants it now. And it was this face that stood out to Jesus. Here is a woman who was adamant that he could heal her daughter because he recognized who he was. She recognized who he was before many Jews recognized who he was. So Jesus frequently tested people to see or prove their intentions. He did this through questions or challenges. This is what I think he was challenging you, her. I want you to listen to this, these challenges. This is what he was challenging her. Do you know who I am? Do you recognize who you are in relationship to me? This woman was in a hopeless situation because of her DNA. She persisted because she saw who Jesus was. A hopeless situation turned into a miraculous situation because of faith in who Jesus was. The story is recorded in the Gospel of Mark also, and Mark records it like this, the end of it like this. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. He was, Jesus was very pleased with that conversation. I want to look at another hopeless situation. This can be found in John 8. If you want to turn to John 8. This is another very, very up close and extremely personal. This is the one, and I noticed none of you shouted this out when I asked, and I thought it would be the very first one. This is the story of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus is in um, the temple courts, which is the area outside of the temple courts. And people are gathering around him. And this is what it reads. The teacher of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. 
But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So again, let's look at what is happening here. The religious leaders bring a woman caught in sin into the temple courts making her stand before everyone. Can you imagine the humiliation of that? They drag her into the courts, um, have her stand there while they say, this woman has been caught in adultery. They're hoping to entrap Jesus by how he responds to the law. By the way, the law he is referring to is found in Deuteronomy when he talks about what to do with adulterers. And you don't just stone the woman you stone the man. So they're not following the law. They only brought the woman. Jesus ignores them. Then Jesus challenges them about their sin life. Remember what I said earlier? Jesus likes to use questions to challenge us, to challenge us in our relationship to him. This is another one. He's challenging them. You without sin throw the first stone. They leave. One by one, they leave. Then he has a personal conversation with this woman. It's a very short one that is extremely intimate and personal. He does not condemn her, but he does challenge her to change. Go and sin no more. Two women who meet Jesus up close and personal, both were being judged by men. One is identified and judged by her DNA, one is judged by her sin. They were devalued because of who they were and what they did. Both these women encountered Jesus in an up-close and personal way. Both of these women were touched by Jesus. Both were offered God's healing power. One, her daughter is healed. The other is offered spiritual healing healing if the men around Jesus that would have been the disciples for the one woman and the religious leaders for the other woman if they had followed through with what they thought was best one woman would have been sent away without ever encountering Jesus the other one would have experienced a horrible death of stoning Instead, Jesus offers life with him. What he says is, you met me. Now your life should forever be changed. Hopeful situations made hopeful because of the presence of Jesus. My husband and I live out in the country. Some of you have been to our house, and you're going to all be invited out again the end of August or 1st of September for a post-pandemic barbecue. I don't know. We haven't named it yet, but we're looking forward to that. Anyway, I was out uh, in my driveway washing my car. I think this happened about 12 years ago. And um, I'm out in the country, not a lot of people around, and I'm washing my car, and I hear this noise. And I look up, kind of startled, and at the end of my driveway is a woman that I had never seen before. She's a tall woman, long blonde hair, and she is just sobbing. She is just crying her heart out. And I look around thinking, you know, is this kind of a setup? I mean, that just went through my mind for a minute, you know. I'm out there in the country, and here's this woman I've never seen before. And all our neighbors are, I mean, I can see my neighbors, but they're not real close. And uh, 
So I walked up to her and I introduced myself and I says, can I help you? You're obviously extremely upset. What can I do to help you? And she's sobbing and she's saying, I can't believe you did this. I can't believe you did this. Who does that? I can't believe. And so she's just extremely traumatized, extremely. And I said, will you come inside? I'll make you a cup of tea. I'm trying to calm her down. Come inside and make you a cup of tea. So she let me take her inside, and I sat her down, and she's still, and she's just, she is just, you know, I even thought at one time maybe I should call 911 because she was so upset. So I put the tea kettle on, and I come back, and I sit down opposite of her, and <coughs> she starts telling me her story in between the sobs, but she had evidently, she was from New York, She'd gotten in a car with her fiancé to come clear across the United States. Their destination was Portland. She actually thought she was in Portland. I had to tell her that she was in Junction City, and she had no idea where Junction City was. Um, and, um, and they were going to meet up with some friends in Portland, but they had stayed the night at a house down the road from us that had just recently become a rental. So I didn't know the people that lived there. And they'd gotten in the car to go to finish the trip to Portland and um, or to these to meet these people and they had a fight and he opened the car door and pushed her out and she had no idea where she was she didn't know where to go for help and so she made it back to my house so she must have backtracked a little bit because he pushed her out there at the light on um, Territorial and Lawrence some of you might know where that's at Clear Lake it intersects there that's where he pushed her out at and um, so I, she asked to use her phone, and she calls her parents. And I can tell by my side of the conversation, her parents are relieved to hear from her, and they're going to wire her money to get her home. So then she needs to get to the airport. I said, uh, Rennie, not a problem. Let me change my clothes. I'm headed in to meet my husband anyway. Um, I said, I will, the airport's on the way. I'll, I'll get you to the airport. And they were going to wire money and have a ticket waiting there for her. I, I don't know the the exactly but she needed to get there and so she said okay and so I went into my bedroom to change my clothes and pretty soon there's a knock on the door and it's her and she says I'm just gonna start walking I'm just I can't sit still I'm just gonna start walking and um, I said well wait for me I'm just a few minutes nope nope I'm just gonna start walking so she left and I hurried and I changed my clothes and I was only five minutes behind her but I could not find her I drove real slow and I'd gone about six miles and got to the store at Alvador and I got out and went in and asked if anybody had seen this. I was concerned about her. She was distraught. I think she might have been coming down from some drugs or something. I don't know. Um, and uh, they said, no, they hadn't seen her. So I got back in my car, and I prayed for her, and I thought, well, that's it. Gone a couple more miles down the road, and there she was. So I stopped, and she recognized me, and she got back in my car, and she said, will you take me back to where I was staying last night? I've got to get my stuff. I left without all my stuff. And I said, okay. So I went back about six or seven miles back past my house and to this other home. She was staying at the end of the road. And the whole way she's telling me, you know, just how upset she is and how scared she is. And he, she kept saying, he said he loved me. He said he loved me. You don't throw somebody out of the car if you love them. You know, and she's just reasoning through this. She was, she was very traumatized. And um, I didn't want to take her back to the house, but we got back to the house, and his car was there. And she goes, oh, so-and-so's here. Good. I can get my stuff and find out, you know, what's happening and all that. And I was really nervous about letting her out. And I said, do you have any money? Because my thought was she might need money to get a taxi to at least get to the airport or something. She goes, no, I don't want your money. She says, I have some money. She says, and my parents are, you know, going to make sure I get home. So she wouldn't take my money. And so she gets out of the car, she leans back in, and she says, thank you. And I says, you know, I knew right then. I had to tell her that God loved her and God was valuable to her. I had to tell this woman that because she was feeling like dirt. And so I said, Rennie, I want you to know that we have a wonderful God. He created you. He loves you. He's valuable. He will not let you down. And she looked at me. She gets back in the car. She puts her arms around me. She starts sobbing again. And she says, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you for that.
she gets out of the car and I watch as she goes up the driveway and somebody opens the door for her and she was greeted kindly. It was another woman and I could tell that it was, it was okay. So I left. And I'd like to tell you the rest of the story, but I've never seen her since. Um, the people that lived there moved out within 48 hours. It was vacant. We were told later that it was some kind of a drug bust going on down there. So they only lived there for like six or eight weeks. It was just a real, real strange situation. Um, I do pray for her. That's why I can remember her name because usually I don't remember people's names for 12 years. But I can remember her name because God brings her and I pray for her. But here was a woman that was totally devalued. And the idea that God would value her would change her life. I hope it did. I don't know. I never heard from her. But at that moment, she was touched. At that moment, she was touched. So what do these stories tell me about, <laughs> about Jesus? And I say me because I started making a list and I, because this is what things that st stood out to Debbie. Other things will stand out to you as God speaks to you through his word. But these are some things that I saw. First of all, I noticed that Jesus shows up, and he wants us to see him. He shows up. He's there. He's present. And the other thing, he doesn't always act the way that we think he should act. I mean, the disciples were probably totally puzzled why he did not send this woman away. And the religious leaders were upset that he did not condemn this woman. So Jesus does not take his clues from us. He invites inner examination. Who are you? Remember what I felt he was asking the woman? Who are you and who are you in relationship to me? Jesus believes all people are valuable and redeemable. Last week, Pastor Mark gave a sermon on how we were all made in the image of God. Do you remember that? And he said, everybody's made in the image of God, and you need to treat them like you know that. Jesus sees the heart and honors the intent, or he sees the heart and challenges the intent. And this next one really jumped out to me. I don't know how I did it on the PowerPoint. Um, Jesus is okay talking about sin. You know why this really jumped out at me? Because when I'm doing something that I know doesn't please God, I don't run to him and tell him. <laughs> In fact, I tend to do this. He doesn't want to be around me right now. Jesus doesn't really want to talk to me right now because I'm making decisions that I know wouldn't please him. I'm I'm, you know, in a position, I'm, you know, angry at my boss, whatever. But that's exactly when Jesus wants us to run to him, is when we are full of sin and we know it. Because his grace, like the song we sang earlier, his grace is greater than our sin. Jesus loves everyone. Jesus wants to bless people. Jesus offers a changed life, a transformed life. And listening to Jesus and reading God's word, it should challenge us. When we read Jesus' words in the New Testament, these encounters that we're going to look at, these times that he touched people that we're going to look at, it should challenge us. We should say, where are we now? What's he saying to me? That's what I got out of, out of looking at these stories. I think God will probably give you some of your own, that uh, while we were looking at these women that you thought, oh, wow, that means when Jesus is up close and personal, this is what it means. When Jesus is up close and personal, this is what I hear. This is what I've seen in my life. This is what he's done for me when I've allowed him to touch me and get up close and personal. So this is what I believe. Jesus' job was and still is to touch people in such a way that we would recognize his love and accept him into our lives. That is why God sent his son 
because plan A of the covenant wasn't working. Plan B, he sent his son through those people so that we could know God, see God, and experience a changed life. Jesus' job was, and still is, to touch people in such a way that we would recognize his love and accept him into our lives. God bless you this week. Let's just take some time to contemplate who we are and who we are in relationship to Jesus. Lord, just speak to us. Touch our hearts.
Have you had a good day in the Lord today? Let's sing What a Friend. Good morning, everybody. Um, before we leave, I want to thank Debbie for a wonderful sermon this morning. Um, there's a couple items I want to remind everybody of. The first is if you um, want to give a tithe, the tithe buckets are in the back. If you're at home viewing from home, you can either send a check to the church or mail it, whatever uh, works for you. And then I know everybody's getting a little excited because we're getting vaccinations and stuff, but we still would like any conversations that occur, move on out of the four year and meet outside. And we'd like to thank you all for coming. <laughs>